name's Luke Townsend. I work for the City of Cape Town Library Service. And I'm here in Weinberg with renowned piano player Andrew Lilly, who's a teacher, a musician, an author, and very well known in the jazz fraternity and one of the top jazz musicians in Cape Town and South Africa, a renowned pianist. Andrew, what is your full name and when were you born? My full name is Andrew Christopher Pritchard Lilly. And I was born on the 7th of September 1962. Uh, what kind of extraction were your parents? My mom was born in Swaziland. Yeah, and my dad was born in Cornwall and he was a Brit. When did he come to South Africa? Well, he came to South Africa after World War II because he fought in the worst parts of um, the Asian Pacific, in Okinawa, and, uh, and they used to stop at Cape Town. He became familiar with Cape Town in the 40s when he was in Cape Town and there were jazz gigs and there were things that he could play and then eventually he got a job in the in the very first sort of incarnation of the symphony orchestra. So he was a musician? Trumpet player. There's a very strong tradition of of brass playing in, in, in the UK so he yeah. got a really good front foundation and probably some really good teachers in the military bands in the Royal Marine, Marine Band but yeah. then will you know and he was gigging a lot in London actually wow. at in his in his late teens playing in jazz gigs I mean, he was a really good busker in that, in that style. I mean, I was amazed even when he was in his 80s and he'd kind of stopped playing. It's, he could still pick up the trumpet and, and, you know, cut a chorus in the style of, of Armstrong and that sort of, wow. you know, the swing. Not Dixie Lambert swing, you know, the phrases and everything. He had, a, he, 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 he had something happening there. Yeah. <laughs> Did he meet your mother through music as well? Yeah, he met my mom. She was from Swaziland, so whom... You know, she expressed interest in, in doing music and her mother and father sent her to uh, the College of Music here in Cape Town. And she was standing in the queue one day and, and the person in front of her was studying harp and she decided for some reason, some shining light came down to her and she, she just said, I'm going to want to do harp. So she, she finished at college and then there was a job that came up in the symphony orchestra because harps are very unusual instruments, I suppose, in that they're... You know, you, you've only got one of them in the orchestra, maximum two. And she did the audition and everything, and, and she didn't get it. She actually went to study in the Royal College of Music in London. Then she applied from London, exactly the same application, in the same year. And then she got it. And what was that job? It was the principal harpist of the Cape Town Symphony Orchestra. Okay. Yeah, no, so now we're talking about, like, 1956, 57. She would have met my dad then. And your mother is? Doma. What is his name? Roy Lilly ultimately became the principal trumpet for many years in the symphony orchestra. Mm. So how would you describe your community that you grew up in? You know, as a child, I, I grew up around symphony orchestra musicians because my parents were in that. So everybody that was at my house <coughs> and all their kids were all children of, of symphony players. You know, so they, that was what I knew, you know, basically about music. Everything was ordered around that. Stop playing music. You know, like obviously, if surrounded by music, my parents, you know, made sure that I had proper instruction, classical instruction, found good teachers, and they made sure that I'd had I had that opportunity to explore whether I had talent or be a musician. I had the opportunity because I was surrounded by musicians, so it's, I was already playing at six. I was largely classical, but I had an interest in playing other forms of music. So even I remember in the seventies, interest in playing sort of tunes off the radio and stuff that to it, like learning Billy Joel tunes and, and learning tunes that I'd heard on the radio. I did grades, all the various grades and stuff. And then during that time, my brother had actually started a sort of barn dance band. You know, What's like his name? Patrick. So we, we used to play in the barn dances and, you know, as kids, your parents always want to find some safe place for you to not get into trouble. And in those days, the church was quite a good option. So they would always drop us off as kids at the Salvation Army. And so, yeah, so then that opportunity of playing in that barn dance thing, because that's, you know... The, my so brother was it country in, music? I guess you could say so, yeah. Square uh, dances. Yeah, square dances. So I would be playing the piano, which is just repetitive, yeah. sort of playing over and over again the same bit. But in that repetitiveness, you sort of maybe develop a, a kind of a looseness or a sense of improvisation. And we had a bass player and a drummer. And, and, and then after school? 
Well, after school, you know, then the army had kicked in, so then they were looking for us. And then my brother had managed to find his way into a Jewish camp in Kimberley because he was actually also a good actor and he pretended to be Jewish. And my brother said, look, I'm Jewish. I'm in a safe place here. If you're going to come now, you must come now because I can organize that you come to this camp because obviously you're also going to be Jewish. And then right. you might not have, a, have that opportunity. So he had a band there and he was sort of, which could have been anything from Burumisik to whatever was on the radio for people to dance. It was a way of getting out of combat. Uh, yeah, so by then I was just interested, you know, sort of not sure kind of musically what was going on, but I was still playing classical music. But when I went to the army, that was taken away from me. So I didn't have opportunity to practice and have a piano, to do my regular, rigorous classical. You know, there was no monitoring then in the army. So I kind of lost balance there and I just would find a piano. And then my interests started to take effect. And by then I'd already heard people like Chick Corea and stuff like that. And I, yeah. I started to get less interested in Billy Joel and more interested in, in Chick Corea. And then I was trying to source his music and play his tunes. And yeah. Are there specific musicians who are important? Well, Chick Corea was like, I guess, an easy one because he managed to bridge the gap between the classical and jazz because he had a strong classical background as well yeah. as the music that he was playing. It was quite Spanish flamenco style, yeah. which could be seen as performance music. So you could literally learn a song of his and perform it and it would have integrity. So, um, but, at, but, at, but at one point, I do distinctly remember my brother bringing home an album with Herbie Hancock on it. And it was a Miles Davis uh, recording called My Funny Valentine. I knew that that sound was what was getting me because I'd, I'd picked up bits of the, the blues element in you know, when you're a kid listening to Earth, Wind and & Fire and stuff and they'd have a little bit of improvisation and soul music, I sort of started liking that music more than pop music. And yeah. then I found the bits that I liked about soul music were where there was a solo, you know, where you'd hear like um, a tune like Street Life, you know, but then I can't remember who the pianist is on that. Joe Sample. Joe Sample. You'd hear Joe Sample take a solo and I think I quite like that, you know. And so yeah. I sort of became more interested in that in that aspect of it and so curious so when i heard herbie hancock that was like listening to advanced joe sample but extremely like oh, very advanced this is early 80s so that was the time of george benson yes the crusaders yes and which was already i mean was that because growing up in cape town you were being exposed to yes music was so yeah and to to backtrack uh, the girlfriend that i was dating was lisa garson and she her parents were also from a musical family and she was quite ahead of her time she sort of introduced me to stuff but we a girlfriend and boyfriend at the age of 16 and 17 we used to steal my parents car and drive out to philippi and to those areas which were sort of no-go areas to go and watch jonathan butler and the rockets and uh, the shoulder brothers and you know whomever was playing because we because that music was the nicest music and mm. we used to go to a club in claremont called the crawl which was mixed it, everything was mixed it was a kind of an underground world where just people were doing stuff and, and just enjoying each other for what they were and, and the, the commonality of of things that they enjoyed together. There was no sort of racial... So I didn't know, I don't know how we did it, but we would just drive out into those areas and, you know, drive a car and end up in a car with people busting pipes. And it, was, it wasn't what I would call safe okay. options, but I think because of the fact that we had taken that chance was sort of respected and nobody... There was never... I never felt like I was unsafe. Lisa, again, has said to me, you know, there's this guy called Merton Barrow. I had no idea that these guys existed. And she found Merton Barrow. You know, you've got to watch Merton. I went to see Merton Barrow. And Merton was a, was an, a sort of an undercover icon, yeah. you know. So he ran that jazz workshop. Yeah. And when I discovered that, I actually found a mentor, somebody who had knowledge, who had an understanding, who had a history, who could nurture and had a very welcoming spirit. And so I ended up going to the jazz workshop and, and it uncovered her. Yeah. And I ended up going there. I remember the first person I ever encountered was Mike Perry. And he was like really good. He, you know, he would, he would have been a, uh, he would have come from Merton. So he just, mm. I would have been eight, 17, 18, 19. It would have been 1979 to 81 or something yeah. like that. 
You know? so, so did, when did you start playing gigs? Well, by then I started playing gigs. Once I was out of the army and back in Cape Town, then, then avenues for doing things sort of spun off from the work, jazz workshop. And then you get involved in, in sort of mostly playing, you know, whatever, sort of pop music and stuff. And, and you know, like one thing would sort of lead to another. And yeah. Just you get into the gigging scene and then you start to meet other people. I met Dave Ledbetter there. Yeah. Oh, okay. I met James Schofield, the guitarist there. And, and you start building a sort of a community, which is what you need of other musicians who are also attached to other things and possibly to other gigs. And so you sort of would get pulled into a scene and if you were of any use, somebody would book you. At what stage did you, did you go to Berkeley? Yeah, when I came out of the army, I was looking for some way to, I mean, then you're, a, then you're a young adult and you have responsibility and you know, the army has already charred three years of your brain and time. So I went and did architecture and I got into the architectural school. And I did three years of architecture, which during which time I was gigging a lot more. It was like the, the late 80s. And a friend of mine who was, he, he had a friend at architectural school. His name was Gary Finberg and he was a guitarist. And he used to visit this guy because he was at Berkeley. It was affordable. And I heard that he was at Berkeley and, I, and architectural school, I would have pursued it. But in my gap year, I said to my mom, I want to get out of this place. Because the moment we had a gap year, the first thing I got was a call up. You know, so I said, I, I can't bear this. I need to get out of here. And so she sent me to Berkeley. And I got into Berkeley. I auditioned and I got into Berkeley. And, uh, but Gary let me stay in his flat while I got my, my feet together. You know, and I made friends there. And Nick LaRue was there with me. And I met him. Actually, I was in an ensemble there one day at Berkeley. There was, there was this guy in the corner sitting very like on his own there with a saxophone. I remember we played some tunes or whatever and the teacher. And then, and then I heard this guy speak. And I was like, you South African? And it was Nick LaRue. And he was like, so, so then I hooked up with Nick and we had a great time at Berkeley together. We yeah. actually lived in an apartment together and we did crazy things. And, you know, I studied with some good musicians way ahead. I mean, I think I was too young to go to Berkeley. I don't think I knew enough. I certainly didn't know what my students know now when they go there. The first guy I ever studied was a guy called Donald Brown. He was a pianist with Art Blakey, which was like walking into a, into a room with jazz god. Yeah. And he'd written a few tunes which were really directed at apartheid situation. So he, and he knew I was from South Africa and I was white. I never got a bad vibe from him ever. He yeah. was this, he was super nice. He was nurturing and wow, what an amazing guy. Also a guy called Bruce Barth, who was a protege of Donald Brown and used to often dip for him when Donald Brown couldn't do gigs. So, and he was very nurturing, very good. And he was, ended up being a very good player in New York. Also studied with Ray Santisi, who is an icon who taught people like Keith Jarrett, or at least Keith Jarrett passed under his sort of tutorship. He said, when I asked him, what was it like teaching Keith Jarrett? He said to me, oh, yeah, talented kid, talented kid. And I was like, yeah. It, it was, and I was actually studying music synthesis because I thought that would, you know, I was in, it was the fusion period. I was into yeah. that. So I was studying music synthesis, or programming synths and, you know, that okay. whole thing. Sampling it just begun and, you know, like it was... It was cutting edge, but I mean, basically everything that I got taught at Berkeley and the, every studio that I'd ever encountered or was in, you could basically do all of that stuff on your iPhone now. It was the beginning of a, of a world which has now been reduced to a single iPhone. Yeah. You know? That study is, I think, what got me into the university when I came back. Going back in time, you know, when I was sort of still going into the dangerous areas looking for inspiring music, I had encountered Winston Mankuku. And, and I think Mike Perry used to play with him at uh, yeah. the jazz workshop, probably said to me, oh, come and watch my gig. I'm playing at the Sun, the Sun Hotel with Winston Mankuku. And he was playing a sound that I wasn't really familiar with, but it was basically Coltrane. And I think Mike Perry was sort of um, his uh, facilitator. One evening I went to go and watch Winston at the Sun Hotel in Strand Street. And there was a young guy playing electric bass and, and the bass player was very good and he could improvise. Yeah. That, and I realized, I like this, whatever's going on here, I must have asked somebody, who is that? Who's the piano player? Who's the bass player? And the guy said to me, no, that's Mike Campbell. And, and so I sort of followed him around a bit. But anyway, when I came back from Berkeley, nine, nine, no, 89, yeah. So going back in time, Richard Pickett was involved in the jazz workshop, the drummer, 
and he used to play a lot with Mike and Winston and he used to play a lot with the Shoulders and Jonathan Butler, a really good drummer. And Richard Pickett asked Merton Barrow, who can I get to, to dip for Tony Shoulder? I mean, you'd think there'd be hundreds of people that could play that night. But yeah. for some reason, Merton said, well, you can get this young kid, Andrew Lilly, yeah. he can do it. And I ended up playing in this club, depping for Tony one night with Richard Pickett playing. I mean, and it was cra- it was such a weird, but Richard was so cool and everything. And then at one point, Richard and Campbell came back from America. He started a band called Pound Seats. And it was like a sort of a fusion band. And, and Richard was the new, they were looking for a pianist. And they tried to get Merton Barrow to play. And Merton said, yeah. no, he didn't want to play, but he'd recommended this kid. And then I went to, I ended up in a garage in Hart Bay auditioning for Campbell. And I guess the fact that I could read and just play for Campbell being a being a, a professional musician was such a dream come true that he didn't have that he could actually write charts and they would be played and learned. Yeah. That he just took me on. Yeah. And so I ended up playing in this band Pound Seats. And then I think the fact that I'd gone to Berkeley and, and the band sort of broke up, when I came back I had established a relationship with Campbell. And by then he had taken a job up at UCT teaching. They needed another position because he was completely oversubscribed and so I ended up going back to the college on coming back to from Berkeley on the request of Campbell to come and help him teach contemporary music practice which was synthesizers and you know because it was a fusion period so I came back and yeah 1990 yeah well then I went back to Berkeley finished my studies and then I I did some naughty things for a bit and then I came back again that would have been now 1991 yes and then did you immediately start working at the university? Well, no, then a job, permanent job came up. And Campbell wrote to me and he said to me, you should apply for this position. I think the fact that Campbell was from North State, Texas, and had been through a jazz kind of study sort of structure, and the fact that I'd have been in Berkeley and had gone through a study structural you know, kind of program, as well as having specific focus in music synthesis, because that position that came up was to teach contemporary music practice and theory and that, and that I had the qualifications for it, which probably nobody else had then. And then I got the gig and, and uh, it was, I liked it, you know. And then, you know, South Africa seemed like a good place to be at the time. So you, you worked at university since... Well, since, no, no since 1992 and then one year before that in 1989. Yeah. Okay, so, so I've been yeah, there like for, yeah. for like 30 years or whatever. Yeah because nobody else wants them. You know, I ended up now I'm the director of the College of mm-hmm. Music, which is kind of a starting this year, which is going to be interesting. But, 2023. Um, 2023. So was the music industry relatively do you think it was in a, in a relatively healthy state? Um, you know, if I make an, I like analogies, but if you can imagine the community was positioned in a particular way before that in an unhealthy environment, but collectively was, were quite healthy. The, the musicians themselves, it, there seemed to be no problem with Mike Perry playing with Winston Mancuku, mm-hmm. and there seemed to be no problem with it. There seemed to be a community, and all I can, all I can say is that at that point, Somebody came and took a jug of water and like pouring it on a on a, a stable um, kind of corridor of ants. It just got scattered, you know. So mm. We were all still there, but but when it came back together, it came back together in a in a unhealthy way. Okay. Because then the politics kicked in. Yeah. And then it was like bean counting. You can't play on this stage because this is funded by the Dutch and the Dutch oh, went, no, you know. No. And it, then it just got polarized and government kicked in and it just got ugly. And then yeah. so Universal Records, BMI, Sony, all of those companies came into South Africa. And the first thing they looked for was to suck up artists. But instead of, of, of looking at established artists that might have been there already, people like Winston Mancuku or even like established white players or even, you know, they, they picked up all the, all the new young black, as in black, African players. So, and they just whipped up every single graduate from the College of Music program and gave them top, you know, recording contracts and just jettisoned them up to the top. And then you had this entire hierarchy of, of wealthy recording artist musicians that had gone from zero to hero in a matter of like two months. And, and the shadow, their shadow was just cast on an entire 
you know, underground world that had existed before mm. them that was no longer visible. And did, did that also have an effect on the style of music that was being performed? Yes. That popular sort of what's now become sort of smooth jazz is what I guess Universal and, and, and Sony were pushing. Now I think more a lot of those artists are finding their sort of African root. You see a lot of stuff sort of, but it's taken a long time. musicians were you playing with at that stage? You know, like there were, I mean, really, the, I was busy gigging, you know, but I, it was literally everything from playing, you know, the Grahamstown Festival, doing show music to playing, you know, playing for uh, musical theatre, playing for shows, playing for gigs, playing sort of crossover music. And but, then, but with who? Which, which um, musicians Well, were now you see, and, you know, I, um, people like Kevin G Gibson. Gibson I was often playing, yeah. Gibson or Barry Van Zale or those kind of people were often playing. But I also had played with um, a lot of the funk bands, Daryl Andrews, I was playing with in the clubs like Montreal, is the oh, club yeah. I was talking yeah. about, and, and also the Galaxy and places like that. So I, I played a lot with Daryl. But was there, was, were there any gigs. Of the musicians that you had a particular connection with? In yes. The Tina Scow, I would say, you know, was somebody that I had a strong connection with, and we used to do a lot of gigs together, and I met a lot of people through her, like people like Dave Ledbetter and. Um, and Basil Moses and yeah. um, Kevin Gibson. You know, when I met Kevin, I could I immediately realize, okay, this guy is different from the rest of the bunch. He he he's he plays a lot better than everybody else. <laughs> so I thought that th I'd like to carry on playing with this guy because this feels right. Because every time I played with him, I'd feel good. So I thought, okay, it's something that I need well. this guy around, yeah. like a like a cup of coffee, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and and there were a lot of regular gigs, like the Green Dolphin was regular gig. Yeah. You know, and I was playing there regularly. I also met Bruce Cassidy, who's a massive mentor for me around that time. And I think we used to go and James Schofield, myself, used to go and watch him play at the Oyster Bar. Bruce Cassidy, when I saw him play trumpet, I, I think I used to go and watch Noel Klinkhammer. They used to play at the Fairmead Hotel. I enjoyed watching them, but one day I went there and there was this ball guy playing trumpet. And this guy, I realized this guy was like shredding on another, on another level. Like he could play, his fingers were moving you know, there was scale, there was density in his line, and it was it was Bruce Cassidy, and I and I recognised him from going from years before at the Three Arts. I'd seen him there with that blood, sweat, and tears. So I just used to follow him around, you know. And then and then he started band at the Oyster Bar with not very good players, rock players, but he instructed them exactly what to play. But um, but I met Bruce, and then I don't know how I got hooked up. I ended up doing some gigs with Bruce, and then different gigs I played with um, in Joburg, and then. When I came back from Berkeley at one point, he said, do you want to do some movie scores? And I hooked up with him writing movie scores. And so I got involved with Bruce quite a bit. And he had a, he had a gigging scene. So it seems like there were a lot of gigs going on and I was involved in a lot of shit all at the same time. Later. Well, I played in bands like Pound Seats and I played in, but I hadn't generated own bands. But I think that I, you know, we had people that we were always playing with, but I hadn't, hadn't necessarily generated an identity of playing a particular kind of music. But, but I, you made recordings? Yes, I did. Because I ended up playing with a lot of people. So, like, but they, you made them under your own name or it was... Only later, only post of 2000 when I'd met Gavin Minter. He's a real entrepreneur because he's, he doesn't really have anything. He doesn't have any privilege, put it that way, to use a, a woke word. So he often would push me to doing things. I think before then, I had started doing fusion stuff and I was into it. And there's a couple of clips on, on YouTube of us doing gigs at the College of Music of playing original fusion music, hardcore fusion music. You know, I did something with SABC, offered opportunity. So there's recordings lying around of bits and pieces. And I, I got a few mixes out of it, but never managed to complete that project because it was just impossible. There was no money to do yeah, that level. Yeah. Of, you couldn't do it at home. You couldn't do that kind of thing then. You had to pay money for that. So I had made attempts to do recordings 
some of which you can find online of fusion stuff that I did. You know, I met people like Dave O'Higgins, who was a sax player from the UK, and I'd end up playing at the Green Dolphin or playing in Grahamstown with him. So then I would start writing music for that. Yeah. So, you know, those tunes like Okavuyo, and the, they, they came out of that first so project with O'Higgins. Yeah, that was in 2004, you said? Yeah, yeah, or well, 2001, yeah. I think that came out. So that's your, your first solo record? Yeah, yeah. And then sort of 2009, I was then doing a lot of gigs in, in Grahamstown. In fact, we had a strong... Campbell and myself were basically the starter, starting point along with Doris Brubick of the Grahamstown Jazz School project that aligned with the festival then. Now it's become completely massive and it's very political and now I, don't, I think it's on the wane now. But, but, but there I met the Swedes because we always used to be international players and the Swedes are, are real jazz players. They're like jazz cats and I met, met a lot of them there. And then again Gavin came along and he said, Listen, I've got a project with big band with myself singing and I, I'm getting this guy to write arrangements. They're coming down to Cape Town. Don't you want to add on, you know, I'd write some song. I mean, I'd, yeah. I'd write some tunes and then and then next minute I'd be in the studio with like Frederick Norren and, and Johan Holland. And, 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 and These are the Swedish players. Yeah, and the Swedish players. I'd, I'd get Gibson to play because they, they didn't have a drummer, but I like working with Gibson and then okay, Martin so the Shostet. Rest, you and Kevin and... And, and Martin Shostet on bass. Because it's a sextet. It was yes, a sextet. Yes, and Carl Martin on tenor, and Johan Holland on alto, and Frederick Noren on trumpet. So then I'd write three horn jobs. And then I realized who I was writing for. I could actually write intervals, you know, like, like players that were standing next to you playing a whole step apart. Because before that, any attempts to write horn parts in, in the Cape Town setting, not to, not to kind of discredit it, but I guess nobody really was familiar with doing that kind of level of playing continuously. Yeah. It, wasn't a, it wasn't an issue for them. And suddenly I was yeah. like, wow, these guys can play these, this stuff. So then I was starting to write interesting harmonies. To do gigs with them. Yeah, I did a lot of gigs with them. And then I even in, in went Cape to, Town or in Cape Town. We played at yes, and internationally we played at. Um, they were interesting people and, and highly proficient. So we do gigs a lot at the Green Dolphin. I played gigs at the Mahogany Room, which was a club that started yeah, there, yeah. then became Straight No Chaser, and uh, I do various gigs. Played the Nassau Centre and internationally, and, and then Gavin again being central to a lot of operations organized a tour playing his uh, quintet music that he got an arranger to write, which was like an American songbook. Yeah. And then the stuff that I had written. So we went to Sweden and did a tour just playing one set of my music, one set of his okay. music. So I managed to do gigs in Germany, free, with no problem, through James Schofield. And then I did a, a tour... Playing his stuff? Or uh, no, just playing gigs. Or, okay. you know, and, and then a tour with Melanie Skoltz, which was through the you know, Croatia, Serbia. Um, okay, or the Yugoslavian. The Yugoslavian. Ba ba Balkan. Bal Balkan, sort of. I yeah. did a tour with Melanie there. No, and no. now you've got, uh, so you've got uh, Ukavoyo, and then what is the other one? The other one's called, called Brother, Brother Gong. Gong. Yeah. That was Brother Gong. Yeah. 2018. Yes. And then now you about to release. Solo. Now I did a solo piano album, which, which sort of came out of the out of nowhere because I, I took a year off which I was entitled to. I started trying out different things. I've got a nice piano at home. I started, started trying some things out and in the process of trying I set up some mics in my room. But then one day I just sort of played a tune, one yeah. of my tunes as an explorative kind of thing and I sent it to my girlfriend who's in New York and she listened to it and she said to me, but this is so nice. Yeah. Just do a solo album. And I was like, okay. And then and then I did an album in an entire week, in one week. I recorded like 12 tracks until I sort of exhausted my output. So that's what I've done now. And I've recorded that album now and I, I like it and I'm proud of it.
Okay, but now you're you're a published author, so you you've written two published books. Yeah. So the first one, Jaya Style, I published because I they because being published in, or perish at UCT, you know. So publish or perish. So yeah. so I, so I, I sort of try trying to get a publishing deal is almost literally impossible. Yeah. So I just self published the first book so that I could also give it to my students and help. But it also it 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 comes with an ISBN number and it's you know so I published yeah. that. It, it was basically sort of an introduction to students to say, listen, man, you need ear training, you need these things, but you need to not do the wrong thing. You need to do the right thing. This is the tradition. There, This is where it comes from. And these are the avenues that you should explore. So it's not instructional. It's more directional. I, I wish I'd had a book like that when I was a kid because it would have been just a very short little book that just mm. said to me, this is where it's at. Now you can go and find that information because there's a lot of rubbish out there. And so um, I published that. And then further down the channel, I realized, okay, and I love Becky and Seleku's music. The students were crying out for information. And they were saying, why are we always studying, you know, Charlie Parker's solos? Why are we always studying mm-hmm. John Coltrane? Not that you shouldn't, bearing in mind that Becky also studied them. But I sort of tried to position some academic uh, analytical work around a player that I consider to be a serious competitor in the jazz world fraternity. You know, like the music of Becky and Sudeku is unusual, but it's also powerful. But it, but in my opinion, is on the same level as, as the people that the kids are studying. You know, and um, so it's an inroad to say to the kids, hey, here's some music which it, which belongs to your own heritage that you can get into that'll take you to yeah. a, another world, which is the world that you actually want to be in, because it's a language, and that language is a has origins, and the origins are African American, whichever way you try and spin it. But it's able to be be so diverse in, in respect of its expression that you'll find the the language is expressed uniquely through the through the lens of a of a, a Zulu speaking Durban born mm. you know South African yeah and but on a very high level because he's exceptionally talented and he just somehow he's a genius you know. Yeah. is is uh, instructional videos is it something that you ha- had to keep doing when the pandemic actually yeah yeah because the pandemic basically shut down any avenues for face to face musical instruction yeah. which is basically the the way music is is taught so they but, thought, but ha- had you had you kind of foreseen the necessity for doing well I'd, I'd, you know like kids would always know with the iPhones and you know, various other things they would they were always arriving at at their lesson and very often they would just say prof can't you just play that on the piano and then they'd film me playing it yeah. you know or i'd say listen it's easy if i just explain it to you just film it you know and then so i thought okay that's a good way to help but i was happy with it in that domain i said i don't care if you should like i sometimes i'd arrive at a class honestly to be honest and the kids would not pitch for the class and they just leave their iphone on the with their friend and they would put it on a music stand facing me so sometimes i'd look at a class and there'd be three people in the class and four music stands staring at me with wow. iphones but then i got concerned because you know the woke woke kicked in and there were some negatives and then i used to say to students you actually can't do it unless i know it. because if i said something you know wrong so yeah, something, yeah, yeah, if, I, if I use yeah. two words in the wrong way yeah. and, and somebody decided to share it with somebody else and the next minute I'm a yeah, toxic yeah, yeah. but so then I thought I can produce some yeah. video material that would be sanctioned by me where I just talk about stuff and it's edited and I got Final Cut Pro and I started working on that and I, I got quite good at it and eventually I, and then COVID hit yeah. and then I realized okay so I did a course at Berkeley actually an online music course to see how they ran it. it was with Gary Burton and I thought okay you can do this and um, yeah produced basically two years worth of of study material yeah, for, the, the, for it's, theory it's, it's, it's I could actually for, make an yeah. online course like that Do you, see, do you 
you see this that kind of approach to music as being the future of music, or do you think is the live experience actually still the well, I, I, I mean, the live experience is the most valuable. There's no question about it because of the energy of human interaction, the electricity between humans. And I can, and I, and I'm, I know I'm right because when I go to New York and I and I sit in a, in a little gig at Mesro and I'm, and I'm watching a band playing, I find myself being elevated <coughs> to a level of enthusiasm and happiness, which I just don't encounter, yeah. with, you know, listening to music, even though I I can enjoy it. I listen to. McCoy Tyner or something, and I, I love the recording and I listen to it, but then I'm listening to it from an analytical perspective. When, when you're lost in a in a tiny little club underground somewhere in New York having queued for an hour and a half and you're watching Ravi Coltrane play with uh, some strange uh, uh, Israeli pianist with no bass player and I mean, a drummer who plays his ass off and like, you're just like, you haven't heard any, you've never heard anything like this. You just find yourself being elevated and so excited and I realize that that is what you know, live music can never be replaced, and because it's so incredibly powerful, it will never be replaced. Everyone will always know that it cannot. There is no virtual world which can replace the real world of interaction, even though it's it's fun and it's interesting. <laughs> But I think the online world will always be with us as a, as a form of, you know, a quick fix. It has its downsides because you'll find kids are, are not focused on one player, but they're rather, and they flick through the bit of that, oh, I like that, I like that, I flick through, flick through, a bit of this, bit of that, bit of that, and they're not really getting a, a wholesome, focused experience yeah. that would result in a focused orientation. So, you know, so I think that that world will eventually closed down. You can already see with Elon Musk buying up Twitter that it's starting to lose its traction and people are not sure if they really want to get their news from Twitter anymore. They're starting, maybe it's better to buy the Mail and Guardian. So I honestly think books are here to stay, live music, and, and in fact I think that there will be more of a return to that. The online yeah. world will be an item that is yeah, on the shelf but along with the physical yeah. and along with everything else. It won't be taking over and replacing it. It'll just be another option online. Will be another option on the shelf yeah, and with records space. i mean it's a, it's the experience of the the actual experience and so now you find an entire industry has grown up around that the supply of needles the supply of yeah, turntables yeah. what kind of turntable what kind of amp cleaning of the records how do you clean the yeah, records yeah. in fact more around the the rigorous sort of support industries than we ever had as as uh, starting with the record player was just a place to play music yeah. and it has returned as a as a legitimate medium because it is actually a better medium in a lot of respects yeah. if you really want to get the experience of listening to it then you need to go and get the medium to hear it through yeah. properly to enjoy it and the best medium is to go and watch the symphony orchestra or to go and yeah. watch a live gig if you can you know the ultimate medium but if you want that experience yeah buy a turntable and yeah. start buying vinyl okay andrew thanks man no it was a nice yes. i enjoyed the discussion I opened up a lot of